What I'm presenting today is this first uh, result, uh, the first results of a project I've been conducting for three years, over three years now, which uh, is called Corpus of Language and Nature, and which uh, I have uh, entitled a cross-cultural analysis of multilingual speakers in clan. Now this should be okay like this. It doesn't, so I will. Okay, so what are the objectives of, the, of this project? Now, what we want to do is to study the cognitive representation of landscapes in speakers who live in different intercultural contexts and uh, speak their mother tongue and also English. This is at least the requirements for the speakers. Some of the speakers, as we shall see later, speak more than two languages. Now, the first aim of the project is to study the emotional responses of these speakers when they contemplate different landscapes. And in the end, the uh, final objective of the project is to design an atlas of linguistic features in emotional responses in relation to prosody, lexis, pragmatics, etc. Now, just to give you one uh, very initial uh, idea of what we are trying to do is we've seen, for example, with Anna Gladkova, a colleague of the, of the project and myself, we've seen, for example, how equivalent adjectives such as beautiful, aggressivish, and bonito, uh, when they relate to natural phenomena and when we want to describe a landscape, they have a different appearance in these three reference corpora. So, for example, 60% of the cases of beautiful relate to natural landscapes in English, 33 in Russian, and only 7% in English, sorry, in Spanish. So this indicates that when people want to describe a landscape as something beautiful or uh, nice to see, they will have different ways of doing it, and translations are not always accepted or acceptable. So let me first give you some uh, references on how we have based our theory uh, in terms of landscape ecology. I have to say that our team is composed of landscape ecologists, linguists and psychologists. So for example, Sonnenfeld in 67 studied the preferences shown by native and non-native Eskimos in their choice of landscapes to settle down. Or Schaefer and Tooby compared preferences of Scottish and American campers in their choice of campgrounds in the States. And Young and Kaplan compared Japanese, Korean and Western gardens, for example, preferences in terms of beauty and uh, likes. For example, Herzog compared the differences between uh, American and Australian observers when they contemplated Australian landscapes. Or Appleton, who was the person who uh, promoted the prospect refugee, uh, refuge theory, which was tested then by Falk and Balling in the preference for Savannah landscape by Nigerian and American students, and in Dutton, for example, in the choice of calendars, when we look at these beautiful calendars with photographs. What do people prefer, depending on where they come from? Okay? So this is as far as visual aesthetics. Now, we only found a trace of the linguistic relationship to visual aesthetics of landscapes in this study by Hathaway, who uh, analyzed the preferences expressed by English speakers whose origin was Italian-American, Afro-American, and Yugoslavian-American in the US. And they studied the preferences in terms of family culture and landscapes chosen for vacations. Okay? So depending on what people were used to have in the um, conversations at home, when parents related what the uh, what the holidays were like when they were in their home countries, etc. This a person found, this scholar, found this relationship with um, um, these uh, nationalities. So what we uh, believe is that, as Nassau said, culture structures landscapes and landscapes inculcate culture. Okay, so that is as far as the uh, basic relationship between our project and landscapes landscape ecology is concerned. Now, what about cognition and nature? So what we try to study is 
to link, to find the link between emotions, geographic features and linguistic representation. So what we believe is that cognitive and emotional impact has different uh, repercu repercussions in the way people express uh, their emotions verbally. And as I said, as we have this control group of native English speakers and how they de describe uh, landscapes, and that is compared with non-native speakers. And I will show you now the corpus uh, uh, composition. Now, so these are the steps of the, of the project. We first designed the taxonomy of the cognitive representation of nature in language. Then we have these photograph descriptions. We designed the computer platform to collect the data. And then we have the data collection and analysis. So these are the steps of the project. So the description of the theory and the cognitive uh, analysis of how language is represented in nature was uh, uh, published last year by myself and Espigares uh, in this article in the Journal of uh, Pragmatics and Cognition, in which we designed this taxonomy of the basic forms we can find in nature and are verbalized in language, and how these forms have themselves subdivisions and can be explained in terms of natural semantic metalanguage theory. So on the basis of the natural semantic metalanguage theory, we established these seven um, possible features of landscapes that are reflected in language. These are line, shape, texture, density, space, regularity, and scale. So that is the theoretical foundation for the study. We have... Uh, when we started the study, we have considered two types of preferences in the choice of landscapes. Universal preferences, which are shared by all humans, uh, phytophilia, hydrophilia and diversity, and observer's preferences, mystery, risk and domestication. Now, on the basis of these two, um, let's say, types of preferences, universal and uh, observers, we have uh, designed the corpus collection. So our corpus would be within what I would call experimental corpora. That is, we have not collected a, land, a large amount of data with no principle behind it, but we've selected what are we interested in the analysis. So we have independent variables of the observers, independent variables of the landscapes, and dependent variables. Okay? So these would be uh, what we want to study, and this is the, the subject of study, lexicology, syntax, pragmatics, etc. So this is basically the outline of the research uh, design. Okay, we have this, the environment, two types of possible landscapes, the role of humans on the landscapes, and in order to have a statistical validity, we have four combinations of photographs uh, of, you know, of uh, possible characteristics by six photos, so people describe 20 to 22 photographs uh, in, the, um, in the collection of their data. Now, these are the photographs. Now, it's important to say that these 24 photographs that everybody describes, all participants in the corpus describe the photographs, appear on the computer screen of the participants and what we do is we've created a computer platform that enables us to record online. So all the recordings, which are video recordings, arrive at our uh, server at Autonom in Madrid. And on that basis, we can analyze the videos. So th at the moment, we have over 4,000 uh, descriptions. Now, these photographs appear randomly every time. So each participant will have them in a different order, okay, to avoid any uh, bias. So this is just an example of the characteristics that we have for the photographs. So we have examples of dry photographs, dry landscapes, humid landscapes. And on the vertical axis, we've got domesticated landscapes and undomesticated landscapes. So on this basis, we created the, uh, the 24 photograph description. These are the participants that we already have in our corpus. So we've got uh, 
and you see people from all over the places, uh, native speakers, Canada, United States, Australia, also Ireland, um, Eastern European, Western European, some Africans, Palestinian, that is Eastern, Middle, Middle East uh, speakers. So what I'm presenting now, as I said at the beginning, is the uh, result of the first analysis, quantitative analysis of the data. Now, we have two possibilities. The first one is the relationship between nature and biography. That is, to what extent does biography have an effect on the participants' choices of photographs? Okay. So we have um, distributed this in two, let's say, in two uh, aspects. The participants' preferences in the selection of the first photograph, remember it was random, so in 4,000 photographs, if people choose a certain photograph, that means something. So we have the selection of the first photograph, the selection of the first four photographs, because statistically we saw that the first four photographs were influential in the choices, and the selection of the last four photographs, the least preferred photographs. And we have mixed or uh, com uh, contrasted these selections with the biography, urban, suburban, rural, rural origin, the different commands of languages the participants have, and the geographical origin in the world. So we start with the results. Now, what about the general preferences? Now, the participants tend to choose the first photo when it represents human environments. This is uh, consonant with the uh, premises of landscape ecology. And as you can see, the chi square test is significant. So that is a universal phenomenon. People prefer humid landscapes for description. In terms of biographic environment, what we saw is that the participants who grew up in urban and suburban settings tend to choose the last four photographs having human and water resources. Okay, so we, we can see the, the graph and it's statistically significant, the ANOVA test. Okay, so the last four photographs are normally chosen by people who grew up in urban and suburban settings. Speakers who speak one or two languages only, because we have people up to six languages, okay, more than five, six, seven, etc. So speakers who speak one or two languages tend to prefer the four, first four photographs with no human and no water landscapes, possibly for simplicity reasons. They are easier to describe. Okay? While people who speak three or four languages tend to choose human and water uh, photographs. And, uh, well, unfortunately, we cannot see the, for some reason, we cannot see the graph. I don't know why. Oh, goodness. Disappeared. In terms of geographic origin, Eastern European and Mediterranean speakers prefer the first four photographs with human and water uh, references. And we shall see later how this implies that they will speak more when they choose these photographs. I'm sorry for the... Okay. American and Australian speakers tend to prefer, in the last choices, human and water photographs. Okay, and here we've got the, and it's significantly, statistically significant, the ANOVA test. Don't have much uh, time to explain everything. Now, so this is as far as origin and biographical uh, description. Now, what about what we call loquacity index indexes? That is, people, there are people who speak more, people who speak less, but we try to find a common, uh, a common feature of people, people's loquacity depending on where they come from. Because we notice that people from certain countries spoke more than others. 
and it was not possible to compare everything. So we, dis we created these loquacity indexes, and we have two loquacity indexes. The loquacity index of photo, which is the average time devoted to each photograph by a speaker in relation to the overall description time of that same speaker, and the loquacity index of category, the average time devoted to each category by speaker in relation to the overall description time of that same speaker. That is, we can randomize, let's say, the length of time devoted to a type of photograph, a category of photograph, you remember the humid and uh, everything, and also that in relation to the other members of your group, okay, to see whether there is a difference worldwide in terms of how much people speak and how much time they devote to the description. Now, we will study, we will compare now the loquacity indexes with the geographical origin of the participants, the population density of the region, and landscape domestication. I mean, these are, these are the features that intersect positively in statistical terms. Now, the first result is that native speakers of English devote more time to the descriptions per photo. So they speak much more, significantly more. You can see, for example, the Australia people here, okay, compared to the other members. And it's interesting to see that Middle East speakers speak much less, significantly less in terms of statistics, than the other groups of speakers. Of course, this, in my opinion, has implications when we want to evaluate and we want, when we want to assess how people speak and how many words they say, because it's not the same to compare somebody from Central Europe and somebody from the Middle East, for example, when they go for an interview or when they do an exam. Well, this is the post uh, hoc uh, test to show that there is uh, a significant result. Now, native speakers devote more time to the description of the 24 photographs. So that is not only in the study of photograph per photograph, but also as a whole uh, corpus. While again, Middle East speakers speech speak much less time. And of course, I believe, we believe, that this has implications in pragmatic relationship. That is, meeting people who speak much less than you do. Okay. Okay, and the post hoc text test. Now, it's also interesting to see that all speakers spend much more time, significantly much more time, in the description of human environments. Okay, so as you can see, this is the, the, the ANOVA uh, test. Okay, so they speak more time when there is something dealing with humans. This is also interesting. Speakers from less populated regions or from countries or parts of the world with fewer population show a tendency for more disparity between human and non-human environments. That is, for example, the blue line represents human environments, the red line represents non-human environments. So depending on the countries, on, on the regions of the, country, of the, of the world, people's, people have a similar time overall in the description or they have a disparity. For example, Australia and Eastern Europe, that is Russia, Ukraine, etc., they have much more distance between, the much more difference in the description of human and non-human environments compared, for example, from, compared to Southern Europe or Central Europe. So people behave differently when they come from these countries. Now, which would be the conclusions of these, as I said, preliminary overall uh, um, description of what is in the corpus, okay? We have, as I said, a universal preference for first photo selection with human landscapes. Speakers with hu urban, suburban origin prefer non-human and dry landscapes. Speakers who have, who have the command of two, one or two languages prefer photographs without human and water landscapes because of possibly less complexity. Eastern European and Mediterranean speakers choose photos with human and water landscapes, preferably. American and Australian speakers' last choice is photos with human and water landscape. 
Native speakers, Australian especially, devote more time to the description of each photograph, followed by Eastern Europeans, and the Middle East speakers devote much less time. The same situation for overall time has to do with the loquacity index in the overall uh, corpus. All speakers spend more time in the description of human environments, so showing human environments makes them speak more. And the intersection between the type of environment and origin of speakers shows that this is especially significant in Eastern Europeans, as the post hoc test says. Now, so what are we doing now? Now, after we finished the collection of the corpus last December, and these uh, results have been uh, drawn, statistically speaking, from the corpus and the questionnaires and the time devoted, now we're starting with the transcription and the correlation of certain features, linguistic features, with these already significant results to see questions of uh, aesthetic language, especially uh, we started with the corpus analysis of beautiful and we're expanding some keywords that appear in almost all descriptions like beautiful, etc., or loneliness, or sadness, etc. And uh, I'm very obedient. And here are the references that specifically speak about the corpus and the project that you also have in your handouts. And this is my content. Okay, thank you very much.